Hello there and welcome to Shots in the Quark. This is the third episode in the motion series which takes us all the way from Newton's laws to general relativity. Once again, there's no need to have watched the previous episodes to learn something from this one, but watching the last video, which I've linked in the description below, will give the ideas explored in this one a clearer context. Now you might be thinking, how can coordinate transformations possibly be interesting? After all, coordinates are just the way we choose to label the points in our space. How do they have any physical meaning? It turns out, however, that there's a fundamental link between your unremarkable coordinate transformations and the very form of the laws of physics themselves. Furthermore, it's this link that's hugely important in the journey from Newtonian mechanics to relativity. What we need first is the idea of a frame. In the previous episode, we talked a lot about frames and how a special class of them, known as inertial frames, replaced the problematic idea of absolute space. For now though, you can just think of a frame as a particular point of view on the world, in which we can label everything using a coordinate system. For example, this person on the train platform here has a particular frame associated with them. In their frame, they're located at the origin and then they can label all the other things that they see around them using coordinates. You can picture a frame then as a set of axes, as a particular coordinate system. There are infinitely many possible frames. We just saw the one for the person sitting on the platform. But you can also have a frame for this wild frog. Yes, that's my best drawing of a frog, which is also sitting on the platform. And we can have another frame, which is moving with respect to these two, for the person sitting on the train, shooting past. Now that we've introduced the idea of frames, we want to take a look at how different frames can be related to one another. Let's take the frame of the person on the platform and of the frog that's sitting next to them. How are these two frames related? Let's use the usual coordinates x and y. In the person's frame, they're located at the origin, so at the point 0, 0. I'll put a P for person. And the frog, if the frog is located, let's say, a distance D away from the person, the frog is located in this red frame at the point D0. Okay? All nice and straightforward. How do things look then from the frog's frame? Well, in the frog's frame, which is this green frame here, the frog is the one who's located at the origin, at the point 0, 0. Meanwhile, the person is located at the point minus d0, since it's a distance d in the negative x direction. What we want to do now is find a relationship between these two different frames, such that if I'm given a coordinate of a point in the person's frame, I can work out what the coordinate of that point is in the frog's frame. In this case, the relationship is very simple. If I'm given a coordinate of a point in the person's frame, I can obtain the coordinates of that point in the frog's frame by subtracting d from the x-coordinate and then doing nothing to the y-coordinate. We can write this down like this. I can have xf, which is the x-coordinate of the frog, is equal to x-person, xp, minus d, and for the y-coordinate we just have y-frog equals y-person. This rule here is what we call a coordinate transformation. This coordinate transformation is a rule that relates the two different frames. Easy. Now let's look at a slightly more complex situation. What is the coordinate transformation that relates the frame of the person on the platform to the frame of the person who's on the moving train? Now our coordinate transformation is going to depend on time. Let's say that at t equals zero, the person on the train is located at the point zero y naught. That is according to the person on the platform's frame. If the train is moving at some constant speed v in the x direction, then at a later time t equals t, this person on the train will be located at the point vt y0, according to the person on the platform. But in the passenger's frame, the passenger is always located at the point 0, 0, because they're at the origin of their own frame. So at t equals 0, they're located at the point 0, 0, and at t equals t, they're located at the point 0, 0 still. This allows us to write down a rule, a coordinate transformation between these two frames. And as we're going to see, it's going to be time dependent. If we look at the x coordinates, we can see that xt, the x coordinate according to the person on the train, 
is equal to xp, the x coordinate of the person on the platform, minus velocity times time. And for the y coordinates, we have yt is equal to yp minus y naught. Great, that's the boring bit done. Now we'll consider something more interesting. In the last video, we talked about a special set of frames called inertial frames. These are a small subset of all possible frames. All inertial frames are frames, but not all frames are inertial ones. An inertial frame in Newtonian mechanics is simply a frame in which Newton's laws of motion hold. If you're not in an inertial frame, then Newton's second law, for example, will contain lots of extra terms, which represent fictitious forces. So the simple form of Newton's second law, F equals MA, only holds if you're in an inertial frame. Why is this interesting? As we've just been discussing, coordinate transformations provide links between different frames. So a key question to ask is, what kind of coordinate transformations link different inertial frames? What is the form of the coordinate transformation rules that will always take us from an inertial frame to another inertial frame, and not a random non-inertial one? Since inertial frames are the only ones in which Newton's laws hold, we can ask the more profound question. What coordinate transformations preserve the form of the laws of physics? To explore this, we can take a look at Newton's second law, f equals m d2x by dt squared. Let's consider a general coordinate transformation. So our new coordinates, x nu, are given by some arbitrary function f of our old coordinates, x old. If our first frame is an inertial frame, then Newton's laws hold in it, and we have f equals m d2 x old by dt squared. Now, what we're interested in are coordinate transformations that are going to take us from inertial frames to inertial frames. And if this is the case, then Newton's second law has got to hold in our new frame as well. So we're going to have f equals m d2 x nu by dt squared, which we can rewrite as m d2 f of x old by dt squared. So if Newton's second law holds in both of these frames, then we have a condition on the form of the coordinate transformations that are possible. We have, equating these two things, we have d2 x naught by dt squared is equal to d2 f of x old by dt squared. Only if our coordinate transformations satisfy this equation will they be coordinate transformations that take us from inertial frames to inertial frames. Let's try a couple of examples of f of x and see whether they really do preserve Newton's second law. First, we'll start with a bit of a weird one. That is, f of x old equals e to the x old. This is quite a strange coordinate transformation to have. So let's see if it preserves Newton's second law. Using a combination of the chain rule and the product rule, you can show that the right-hand side of this equation is going to look like d2x by dt squared times e to the x plus dx by dt squared times e to the x. You can clearly see that this is not equal to the left-hand side. So this coordinate transformation doesn't preserve Newton's second law. This is not a kind of coordinate transformation that will take you from inertial frames to inertial frames. What if we tried the rule that we had earlier? This one, down here. In this case, our f of x old is x old minus v times t. If we substitute this into our equation here, we find that indeed the equation is satisfied. This right hand side is d2x old by dt squared. What this tells us is that this kind of coordinate transformation does preserve Newton's laws. This kind of coordinate transformation does take inertial frames to inertial frames. In fact, this is an example of the most general set of coordinate transformations that preserve Newton's laws. These get a special name. They're called the Galilean group. So there we have it. In Newtonian mechanics, these are the set of coordinate transformations that preserve the laws of physics. Okay, cool story. Why was this worth looking at at all? Notice what the form of these coordinate transformations are and what they represent. This here, is a translation in time, this b, and it represents the fact that the laws of physics are the same at every point in time. 
it doesn't matter when you perform an experiment, the result will be the same at any time. Now look at the x-coordinate transformation law. Now we have a translation represented by this constant a, and we have a uniform motion represented by this constant speed v. What this means is that the laws of physics are the same at every point in space, that's what the translation corresponds to, and that they're the same if you're stationary or moving in a straight line with a constant velocity. More generally, we can say that by considering the symmetries of your space-time, you end up with a certain set of allowed coordinate transformations that preserve your laws of physics. This then constrains what the laws of physics that can describe your universe can possibly be. This is the direct link between coordinate transformations and the laws of physics themselves. The coordinate transformations that preserve your laws of physics influence what laws of physics actually hold. If the Galilean transformations preserve your laws of physics, then your laws could be Newtonian, but we know for sure that they couldn't be electromagnetic, since the laws of electromagnetism are not preserved under Galilean transformations. If you know what transformation preserves your laws of physics, then you've made a big step towards figuring out what those laws are. In the next episode, we'll take a look at what the symmetries of our space-time are, and what coordinate transformations they allow. By considering this, we'll get an understanding of what the form of the laws of physics have to be, and we'll end up right on the doorstep of special relativity. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found this all intriguing. Please like and subscribe to find out what form the laws of physics have to take. And for more, shots in the quark.